I now continue the Lectures in Christian Doctrine by Dr. Joe Sprinkle. The lecture uh, today is the Atonement. Once we conclude that God became man in Jesus Christ, a natural question is one made famous by medieval theologian Anselm, who asked in his book, uh, Cordios Homo, or Why Did God Become Man? The uh, Nicene Creed of 325 of the Christian era answers in general terms for us men and our salvation. He came down and was incarnate and was made man. And this reflects the statements of Scripture, such as Paul's statement in 1 Timothy 1.15, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. But how is it that Jesus' life and death makes possible salvation for us humans? That is the focus of the doctrine of the atonement. First of all, the term atonement. The English word atonement is a compound word consisting of three words, uh, at, one, meant. And it has to do with the idea of becoming at one with God. Now, this is a translation in the Old Testament of a Hebrew word, kiper, Kiper, as a verb, means to atone, arguably uh, derived from the word kofer, which is either a ransom or a gift. And so the idea was to placate, to mollify, to satisfy or appease an offended party, especially by means of gifts. You see that usage of the word in Genesis 32, verses 20 and 21, when Jacob tried to pacify or appease Esau by sending him presents. And that's what uh, uh, atonement has to do with, uh, turning away or placating someone, turning away his anger by means of a gift. Now, sin and burnt and guilt offerings in the Old Testament could be considered gifts intended to placate or mollify God. Now, a gift that turns away a God's anger is a propitiation. And some translations, especially older ones, King James Version, New American Standard, will translate the word atone or atonement uh, or atoning sacrifice as a propitiation a propitiation for our sins. Again, Romans chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2 and chapter 4. Now, the Greek word for to atone is uh, hilash uh, komai, which means to propitiate or appease, and it's generally used to translate the Hebrew word kiper uh, in the uh, Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. Now there are two ways of atoning God's wrath. Uh, one way is by uh, uh, punishing the guilty, as when Phineas kills Zimri in uh, Numbers uh, 21:15 for uh, offenses described in that passage. Uh, when uh, that that happens, well that appeased or propitiated God. The other is by gifts or offerings or sacrifice. Now the idea is this, that sin produces a rift between God and people. Sin, as we saw in our earlier lectures, separates us from God. Atonement is a purging of the offensive pollution that creates that rift. Again, the Hebrew term kiper has a secondary meaning of cleansing or purging. Not as uh, some older commentators thought, it's not a covering of sin derived from kafar to cover, 
uh, but it's more likely derived from kofir, a, a ransom or a gift. It's a gift that turns away uh, God's wrath. Uh, but it does in uh, Leviticus take on a secondary meaning of cleansing or purging as you atone uh, uh, for the sanctuary, you're cleansing it or purging uh, sin from its midst. Now, the question then is, given this background in the Old Testament of uh, what it means to make atonement, as well as uh, the word in the New Testament, uh, well, how is it that Jesus' death atones for sins? And there are several views that have been proposed over the years. Uh, one view that was uh, fairly common in the earliest days of the church is that it has to do with a ransom to the devil. A verse that would go along with that is in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And some of the early church fathers, such as Origen, uh, took this view of the atonement that the devil basically uh, has his rights to uh, have us because of our sin, uh, but that Christ basically paid off the devil by uh, ransoming the devil with his own life. And if you've ever read C.S. Lewis's uh, children's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he takes a similar view of the atonement uh, in that story. In that story, you have Edmund, who had uh, committed sin and, and therefore was in the grips of the witch, which uh, is uh, symbolic of the devil. But the lion Aslan gives up his own life as a ransom to save the life of Edmund uh, from the witch. And you could look at a passage such as Leviticus 16 to support uh, this idea. Uh, there you have a sacrifice of a goat, which was driven out to the desert. Uh, one was for the Lord, the other, uh, one goat was for the Lord, sacrifice on the altar, but the other one was for Azazel. And Azazel uh, might be taken as demons, uh, maybe a goat demon or the devil. Uh, and therefore, this would be a, a ransom to the devil sort of idea there as well. Again, that's not the view I take of it, uh, but that is a view uh, that could be taken and some interpreters have taken. A second theory is, is better, and this uh, theory of the atonement was uh, uh, formulated by the theologian Anselm of Canterbury, and you can see uh, his dates there. Uh, he wrote a famous book, Why God Became Man, or Why Did God Become Man? And he argued this way, that sin is an affront to God's honor as Lord. And uh, Anselm conceived of this in kind of the feudal system, uh, where a serf uh, had certain allegiances and obligations to his feudal lord. And sin is an affront to uh, the Lord's honor, as it were. And we cannot pay our debt because whatever good we do is merely what we were supposed to do in the first place. We already owe that to God. But Jesus is capable of paying such a high debt to provide satisfaction, since as God, he does not owe God righteousness uh, or uprightness the way that we do. Christ, by his perfect life, piled up the riches of merit that could be applied to our sin debts so that humans could be forgiven. Uh, this is known as the satisfaction theory of the atonement. A third theory that's out there is called the revelation of the love of God theory of the atonement, or the moral influence theory of the atonement. And it was uh, proposed by French philosopher, theologian, uh, Peter Avalard. And you, again, you can see his dates, uh, 1079 to 1142. 
And there he argued that the purpose and cause of the Incarnation was that he, referring to Christ, might illuminate the world by his wisdom and excite it to the love of himself. And a verse that might go along with uh, this idea is Romans uh, chapter 5 and verse 8. God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died as a revelation of the love of God. And as far as it goes, that certainly is a true statement. Now, there was a, uh, another theologian, uh, Faustus uh, Socinius, founder of what's called the Socinian Movement, who defended a form of Avalard's approach. Uh, he called it the moral influence theory, that what Christ did was uh, he exerted a positive moral influence on mankind so that we would follow his example and therefore uh, be able to merit uh, eternal life. So that's the third theory of the atonement. Uh, the fourth theory of the atonement is not a very common one. It's called the recapitulation theory that was uh, defended by Church Father Irenaeus. Uh, based on uh, Romans chapter 5, 12 through 21. And he argued that Christ recapitulates in himself all the stages of human life. By his incarnation and human act of obedience, Jesus reverses the course on which Adam, by his act of disobedience, started humanity. His obedience, uh, by his obedience uh, compensates for the disobedience of Adam. Now, even though Irenaeus was an important uh, church father, very few people follow this particular theory uh, today. A fifth theory is called the Christ as Victor theory, uh, defended by Swedish theologian uh, Gustav uh, Alin, who died in 1977. But anyway, in the, according to this theory, Christ, or uh, Christ the victor, Christus uh, victor, fights against and triumphs over the evil powers of the world, the tyrants under which mankind is in bondage and suffering, and in him God reconciles the world to himself. But then I get to the sixth theory, which is the most common theory among Protestants, and it's called the penal substitutionary theory of the atonement. Christ's death was penal in that he bore a penalty when he died. His death was also a substitution in that he died for us when he died. He was a substitute for us. And this can also be called the theory of vicarious atonement. A vicar is someone who stands in the place of another or who re represents another. And so this is a vicarious act of atonement. In other words, Christ's death uh, was in our place and represented us. He took the penalty that we deserved. Again, people like John Calvin, who died in 1564, would understand the atonement of Christ in this way. Similarly, Martin Luther uh, would, would uh, understand uh, penal substitution as the best way to understand the atonement. Uh, he writes, because an eternal and unchangeable sentence of condemnation has passed upon sin for god cannot and will not regard sin with favor but his wrath abides upon it eternally and irrevocably redemption was not possible without a ransom of such precious worth as to atone for sin to assume the guilt to pay the price of wrath and thus abolish sin no creature was able to do uh, there was no remedy except God's only Son to step into our distress and himself become man to take upon himself the load of awful and eternal wrath and make his own body and blood a sacrifice for sin. And so he did out of the immeasurably great mercy and love towards us, giving himself up for up and bearing the sentence of unending wrath and death. 